This is Vern Venom Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. One philosopher has stated that small-minded individuals think primarily about people and things, whereas large-minded individuals think more about ideas and ideals. But unless a person committedly insists upon creating placid periods in the day and in the week for such profound and reflective thinking, one shall not attain to it. And soon months and years are passing by, and one's deepest needs for this are being systematically neglected, and the inner life becomes weakened and enfeebled. Yet it is from this creative inner life that the noblest powers of the greatest of men and women in history have emerged. However it be practiced, and be it described as meditation, contemplation, reflection, or prayer and worship, this cultivation of spiritual insight is fundamental to a satisfying lifestyle. So important is this aspect that Emerson wrote of it, a man is what he thinks about all day long. And again he wrote, the key to every man is his thought. And the scriptures word it, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. One great need of this age is for an exalted philosophic vision. As one observer has said it, the society which scorns excellence in plumbing because plumbing is an humble activity and tolerates shoddiness in philosophy because it is an exalted activity will have neither good plumbing nor good philosophy. Neither its pipes nor its theories will hold water. Human life is indeed a difficult enterprise, but human beings possess three fundamental techniques for dealing with difficulties, thinking, humor, and faith. First, creative and concentrated thinking can unravel countless of the most snared and tangled human difficulties. Second, humor is essential. Abraham Lincoln was criticized for reading joke books during the height of the Civil War, but he replied, if I do not laugh, I shall die. Humor serves both as an emotional safety valve and as a tremendous enrichment of human life. It is a vital asset. Over a century ago, the preacher Henry Ward Beecher said, a life without humor is like a wagon without springs. Psychologists at the University of Massachusetts have found that people who made the highest scores on sense of humor tests also scored highest on tests of their practical, rational abilities. They tended to be the most reasonable individuals, the easiest to get along with, and had the best insights into their own personalities. A good sense of humor and good psychological health are proven to go hand in hand. The ability to laugh is one of God's choicest gifts to humankind. Dr. James V. McConnell, professor of psychology at the University of Michigan, has written that the sheer physical act of smiling has been proven in and of itself to improve the mental attitude of the person who is smiling and has found that individuals who smile more than the average tend to be more successful and effective both in their work and in their lives. Dr. William F. Fry, Jr., professor of psychiatry at Stanford University, says people who find it difficult to laugh at themselves are frequently very defensive and depressed. They begin to feel put upon, hurt, and offended. People who easily laugh at themselves, on the other hand, are secure and comfortable. Their self-respect is intact. He further elaborates that laughter is known to stimulate the muscles, circulation, brain activity, and hormone production and finds that the best way to learn the secret of laughter is to look for the, quote, absurd, unexpected, inconsistent, and therefore laughable aspects of every experience. Dr. Wallace Wallen called laughter a magic touchstone against worry and frayed nerves, a prime characteristic of the healthy personality. In review, three great techniques for dealing with human problems are thinking, humor, and, finally, faith. Faith is an enduring source spring of spiritual and psychological energy, hope and happiness. The inventor of the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell, wrote that man alone among the animals is not content merely with the satisfaction of his physical and material needs, but that man above all needs something to believe in. The greatest ideas in the history of human thought worth believing in are the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, that the kingdom of God is within the individual, that God has a plan for this planet and a purpose for human life, and eternal life beyond this life for those who will live by eternal values, truth and beauty and goodness, and seeking to be perfect 
even as the Father in heaven is perfect. Psychologists recognize two fundamental types of motivation in human beings, internal and external. External motivations are such rewards as economic success, material wealth, etc. Internal rewards and motivations are concerned with meanings and values, the quest for a higher purpose, self-actualization, and spiritual fulfillment. The famed psychologist Dr. Abraham H. Maslow formulated a widely accepted list, which is known as the hierarchy of needs, in which the priorities of human needs are listed. As each of the more basic needs is met, the next higher need is sought by the individual. The higher a culture or a civilization advances, the higher the needs which are sought to be satisfied. The most basic needs, according to Maslow, are the material survival necessities. He lists the following. Number one, basic physical needs such as sleep, food to eat, water to drink, etc. Number two, safety and security. Secure lodging, food storage, police protection, pension programs, insurance, economic security, all those fell under this category. Three, the third need is belonging and social needs. This is the requirement for interpersonal association, friendship, fellowship, community feelings, and love. Number four, esteem and status. This is the need to feel worthwhile as an individual and to feel that others think that we are valuable to be recognized and appreciated. And finally, number five, the fifth great need is for self-actualization and fulfillment. This is the highest need listed on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It has to do with becoming all that one is capable of becoming, utilizing the full extent of one's individual human potentials. This includes the need for an inner spiritual satisfaction in life, and it goes far beyond the realm of psychology. This fifth need enters the realms both of philosophy and of religion. And some of the most advanced and workable teachings known to humankind in this realm of the highest need, self-actualization and fulfillment, are to be found in the spiritual insights and philosophic teachings of the advanced thinkers of world history. The concept that the individual is not an aimless accident, but is a child of the universe, a son or daughter of God, and a brother or sister to every other person in the entire human family, that there exists a plan for this planet and a purpose for human life, that physical death is not the end, that the incessant quest for perfection, that divine discontent which has motivated so many of the greatest of the human race, that this all is a God-given gift for the inspiration and exhilaration of problem-solving and decision-making. And this is fundamental to a fully exuberant philosophy of life. These qualities and satisfactions of the inner life are largely independent of the circumstances and inequities of the outer life. The publishing executive Wilfred Funk wrote the following reminder of the fact that even serious physical problems are not necessarily impediments to achievement. He wrote, Take a look at these famous men and the handicaps that failed to slow them. The poet Lord Byron had a club foot. Robert Louis Stevenson and John Keats had tuberculosis. Charles Steinmetz and Alexander Pope were hunchbacks. Admiral Nelson had only one eye. Edgar Allan Poe was psychoneurotic. Charles Darwin, an invalid. Julius Caesar was an epileptic. And Thomas Edison and Ludwig von Beethoven were deaf. But to great individuals, disappointments become challenges, handicaps become hurdles to run, and frustrations but spur the individual to greater effort. When University of California psychologists studied the subjects of optimism and pessimism in a wide-scale survey, they concluded, quote, too often we find that pessimism is little more than a perverse rationalization for lazy or comfortable inactivity or irresponsibility. The pessimist, belittling the likelihood of progress, adds obstacles to practical accomplishments and facilitates the very failure he anticipates. Basically and practically, pessimism is a do-nothing, destructive attitude. End of quote. Psychologists have described an uncreative thinker as one who sees the problems in every opportunity, and a creative thinker as one who sees the opportunities in every problem. William Arthur Ward said to the optimist, all doors have handles and hinges. To the pessimist, only locks and latches.
Intellectual belief and spiritual faith release enormous energies into human life, but these energies must be intelligently directed. Professor Mabel Newcomer of Vassar College once wrote, it is more important to know where you're going than to get there quickly. Do not mistake activity for achievement. Andrew Carnegie declared the average person puts 25% of his energy and ability into his work. The world takes off its hat to those who put in more than 50% of their capacity and stands on its head for those few and far between souls who devote 100%. Harvard medical professor William James wrote, Compared to what we ought to be, we are only half awake. We are making use of only a small part of our physical and mental resources. Stating the thing broadly, the human individual thus lives far within his limits. He possesses powers of various sorts which he habitually fails to use. And Dr. Walter Dill Scott, noted psychologist and president emeritus of Northwestern University, wrote, it is more than probable that the average man could, with no injury to his health, increase his efficiency by 50%. End of quote. Living faith releases the full resources of the human mind and spirit. Dr. Nadine Ellis, a Colorado clinical psychologist, stresses the importance of developing a healthy self-esteem, which is independent of the judgment of others. She writes, Start by changing the things you say about yourself. Never say, I'm too dumb to do that, or I could never succeed at that. And she, too, along with numerous other psychologists, also warns that one must, quote, guard against an unconscious tendency to set a goal so high as to ensure failure. It has been clinically proved that some individuals literally fear success because of the demands and responsibilities attendant to it. The late Dr. Charles Mayo of the famed Mayo Clinic said that fear alone is capable of producing serious disease. Dr. George W. Cryle, well-known Cleveland surgeon, said in his book, The Origin and Nature of Emotions, quote, fear is overwhelming. We fear not in our hearts alone, not in our brains alone, not in our viscera alone, but in every organ and tissue of the body. Yet in the frequently quoted words of the late psychiatrist Dr. William S. Sadler of Chicago, the only known cure for fear is faith, and declared the greatest teacher of them all, have faith in God. And then write to us at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, all this literature, yours with no cost, charge, or obligation. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.